but this doesn't make a big difference. Um, okay, so I'll start off with explaining the title. What do you mean by this title, A Neural Network Walks Into a Lab? Um, and the idea is that's kind of a two, like two different meanings to it. So first is kind of the new reality a lot of cognitive scientists' labs are actually faced right now. And they see this really cool, great models for machine learning that can do really um, yeah, great stuff. And then the question comes up, should we actually use that in our own research? And that's kind of like the starting point a little bit or the motivation of this paper. Um, and the second question is that this is not super straightforward, maybe, and DNNs have their own challenges. And um, so one pr perspective or helpful metaphor we kind of propose is to see these neural networks as similar to human participants that enter a neural uh, a lab with uh, their own prior experiences um, um, that are shaped on and developed. And then you want to test them similar to human participants. And yeah, so this is the general theme of the uh, neural network. Uh, entering the lab, which is a metaphor and the general outline of the paper. So um, just like shortly, why would we, would we be interested in this? So I'm trying to just go to the next slide, Weiji. Right. Um, okay, so um, I mean, a lot of you have probably seen these kind of slides or, um, a lot. Um, so these DNNs can do like uh, very impressive things in machine learning and do um, impressive things on these real world complex tasks. And they have more and more been used as models of mind and brain. And this is definitely not new. Um, you've seen probably a lot of these examples from vision where you see uh, that these uh, networks trained on vision tasks like object recognition. So very show very similar um, internal structure of their representations as compared to human brains. And um, just as to have another um, kind of modality in auditory neuroscience has also been shown where um, networks which are trained to recognize words or um, musical genres also show very similar um, neural activation or internal activation compared to fMRI activations. And um, so I, as I said, I come from cognitive neuroscience and we are always kind of faced with the challenge of mapping cognitive concepts which are very abstract and come from cognitive science to this very complex system, the brain, and in cognitive neuroscience, it's sometimes a bit disappointing that we don't have like a lot of data um, and we want to have more. And so the exciting thing here about DNNs is that they might be providing a link between these cognitive theories and the brain. And here we actually have full access to the weights and the states, and we can actually hope to maybe understand how cognitive concepts can emerge from like smaller or like small level interactions on the level of neurons. And so um, the other exciting things about DNNs is that um, you can actually try to make uh, these models work on more complex tasks than usually is done in cognitive science. And we will talk about this in this paper. So as Wade said, the, this paper is kind of um, the, the outcome or the product of this uh, workshop. Um, and so we took the, the focus here, uh, the target audience being cognitive scientists. Um, which are kind of maybe asking themselves, should I use these models, are already using these models and faced with these challenges. And we focus here on behavior, um, expanding human behavior. Um, and the goal here should be to establish a research agenda of how these DNNs might actually become useful models of human behavior. Um, yeah, and of course, there's, um, we are not like uh, unique with this and there's a lot of other really good and great um, reviews recently coming out that all um, address these problems from different, different perspectives, often more with a focus on neuroscientific data. Um, and so we kind of like are in this context as well. And uh, yeah, as Rachel said, if you missed something important, some paper which is really relevant, you missed this, so please let us know. Okay, so with this, we would start with a kind of provocative question. Is it actually worth the effort to try to use these DNNs as models for modeling human behavior? Why or why not? On yeah, what kind of tasks? So, Weiji? Yeah, so um, I, I, I actually don't think that you can be serious about this, Benjamin. Like, the answer is obviously no. I can easily come up with four reasons why uh, you shouldn't even try, right? So. Uh, you've probably seen the example of, of Go, where AlphaGo can beat uh, the world champion in Go. So clearly they're doing something very different from the world champion, also something very different from a normal human uh, humans playing, playing Go. So superhuman performance in some tasks is, is already a reason to say, well, they're, they're too different. And a second reason would be that uh, 
they don't generalize the same way that humans do, right? So this is a famous um, uh, Atari game, Breakout, and uh, you, you have to use, use your pedal to break down this wall. And in the, in the left example, the pedal is slightly uh, uh, offset compared to the right. And standard neural networks have a lot of trouble general, generalizing between these two very similar conditions that are, don't pose any difficulty to humans. And then you show this example, the auditory example for classifying words and classifying genres. Well, that's all very nice, but uh, we've all heard that once you have these uh, very deep neural networks uh, that do lots of complicated things and uh, you have a system that's almost as complex as the brain itself. So uh, you can't interpret it anymore. So in, in, in a philosophical sense, it's really not understanding anymore. It's just um, like uh, some very complex mimicking that you that doesn't really get you very far. And then I also came from a very different tradition. So I, I came from uh, like carefully controlled cognitive process models, right? So those are um, models such as uh, Bayesian models, uh, it's much, much broader categories or so noisy representations followed by decision rules or diff diffusion types models, uh, the scholar Wagner model for, uh, for associative learning. What th these have in common is that they consist of stages of processing arranged in a meaningful sequence. And now those stages are psychologically interpretable and they uh, generalize across tasks and uh, across domains. And the models that you get that way, they typically have very few parameters, very often two, three, four, and rarely more than 10. So that's, that's nicely parsimonious. In addition to that, they actually fit very well. So what more do you want, right? Why, why is it worth trying to, to do your neural networks? All right, so I try to address these points and um, so why, why this might be like somehow good reasons, but no, we might still want to use DNN. So I start from the back. So I start with last reason. So we already have these really good cognitive process models and that's correct. They're a very, like, they provided us with a lot of insights. And um, let me go to the next slide. So I'm, I'm controlling Wages computer and it's a bit laggy. Excuse me. Right, so that would be the counter argument. So the point is that uh, these cognitive process models, they um, often can explain quite well these like small toy tasks, um, but often you have to handcraft um, the feature representations uh, of these models. So this would be one example here on the left, where you have maybe say, oh, I have orientations, I see orientations in the image or in the task. So I define these tuning curves and then I have an internal representation, the cognitive process model, and this is predefined and handcrafted. And so we know kind of historically that handcrafting feature representations doesn't really scale well to real world vision or real, real world like um, data in general. And um, this has been kind of the challenge for computer vision for a long time. And the big plus here is that deep neural networks can actually learn feature representations from real world data. And this is quite unique um, that we can learn these feature representations from data that is quite close to real world data how we are exposed to um, like uh, optimized to some under some constraints and some kind of goal function. And so this is a classical example here from Dyla and Fergus, where they show like the emergent um, convolutional maps that um, come out of a convolutional deep neural network and it's optimized to um, recognize uh, objects. Um, so this would be a benefit of using more complex models beyond cognitive process models. Um, the other point, Reiji, you raised is, um, well, they're not really useful because it's really hard to interpret them. And um, that is not necessarily the case. Um, the reason is, um, so first, the first point is basically to say, well, they are somehow indeed harder to inter interpret with respect to the cognitive concepts, right? So if you look at attention or memory or some decision process, that's kind of hard to pinpoint in a, a deep neural network. Where does it happen? How does it happen? Um, however, that's a challenge that actually, actually cognitive neuroscience is facing all along, like connecting these uh, concepts to a complex neural activity. And here we have full access to the system. So we can actually hope to make some inroads here and understand more. And then on the other hand, it's actually might be even easier to interpret um, if you like try not to explain it from the perspective of cognitive concepts, but from the perspective of the inductive biases of the model. So 
um, that what, what features of the architecture like recurrence or feedback, how does this drive um, emergent behavior um, or the experience it was exposed to. So we could, for instance, manipulate the training data of a neural network and see what kind of training data, or what kind of visual experience or experience in general is necessary to um, that have certain behavior emerge. And uh, the third component here is the goal function, um, in, uh, which is used during optimization. Um, uh, this would be the number four and three. And reason number one, uh, you said, so DNNs are not useful because they're better than humans. So in general, this is also not a, like a very good argument, maybe because um, this uh, superhuman performance is not unknown to cognitive scientists. You could actually argue that um, ideal observer models are often quite superhuman. I mean, they often serve as a starting point to ask, like, what do I need to limit to achieve human-like performance? So superhuman performance in itself is not a big problem, I, I would say. Often it's actually reverse. It's hard to create a model which um, gets human-level performance. Um, but it's, what is actually more challenging, is a challenge, is the generalization. And um, to look at generalization, um, I want to kind of like give an intuition why we think they general don't generalize really well. Um, so in general, there are usually multiple ways how one could solve a task. So not only one of them. Um, so if you look at this Atari um, example again, um, so you have to move this paddle to hold the ball, ball in the air and then break these kind of colored bars up there. And if we as human looks, look on this task, we obviously see a paddle, which is an object, uh, which moves around, which is spatially invariant. So we see this task with our kind of prior experiences and our inductive biases of learning new tasks. And neural network doesn't know anything about objects and does, didn't have the experience of us. Um, so it might actually just look at the lowest row of pixels and interpret just the, the color or the value of these pixels. And then if you, um, if you train, like if you shift this um, paddle then by a bit, then it will actually fail to generalize. So in general, um, the DNN might learn a particular solution, uh, which is for instance easy, uh, which might even be at superhuman level, but um, the solution might be different from humans. And um, as we kind of define what should be generalized and what shouldn't be generalized, it's kind of the same as saying like, okay, the a network doesn't have human level performance. So this is kind of a key challenge indeed. And it's also the kind of starting point of part, like a large part of the paper to ask how can we actually make these DMMs uh, to behave more human-like? How can we make them learn actually human-like solutions to tasks and therefore also better generalize? Um, yeah, so this is kind of the roadmap of the paper and uh, what's coming up. So establish a research agenda of how DMMs might become useful models of human behavior. And the general idea, and this is not new, there's um, like a lot of people in the field agree on this and have um, argued this. So we want to um, maybe mimic the human prior experience um, more than uh, like previously trained models have. Uh, we, um, in the next step, we want to use human experimental procedures and we want to um, evaluate um, them like human subjects. And uh, I will go into details in a bit. So this is kind of the outline of the paper here. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, I think before we um, point, argue some of these points, um, maybe this is good time for the second theme here of the questions. We could pose in the Q&A, um, like the, the questions, how should we design and train DNNs in ways that are closer to humans? Um, and yeah, so you're invited to um, post your comments in the Q&A and um, or please also upload other comments by users. Um, that have posed the question uh, you also had on your mind. Okay, should we wait or should we continue waiting? I think we can continue. Right. Okay, so what I alluded to a little bit now is um, kind of this idea of the neural network entering the cognitive science lab. So humans, before they enter the cognitive science lab and are studied with our diagnostic tasks, to get insight into the underlying cognitive concepts and mechanisms, they are like shaped by evolution and development. And uh, so prior experience, visual experience, but also like the basically whole evolutionary experience. So we kind of need to mimic this a little bit for our deep neural networks. Um, otherwise we cannot really hope that they like see the world the same once they enter the lab. 
Um, and there are these different kind of knobs you can turn and manipulate. And these are, for instance, that you uh, change the architecture, make, try to make it more like neurobiologically plausible, change the objective function. So a lot of effort is um, put towards like more unsupervised training and unsupervised objectives instead of discriminative objectives like um, object uh, recognition, um, train on more ecologically valid tasks, um, and also multitask training because a lot of the brain or neural network in the brain is um, actually reused for a lot of different tasks and this might shape how these um, representations are formed. Um, yeah, once you've done this building process, then you want to test whether now you know your neural network does behave like humans uh, on the same task. And there you would develop this kind of their diagnostic tasks, which are often like very similar to the lab tasks we have anyways. Um, but you could, of course, expand this to more complex tasks. And this is an interesting perspective here um, where we can't like, wait to kind of talk about this. Um, and this might involve like a limited training on diagnostic tasks. So if you, for instance, build a neural network that is um, trained on uh, minimizing the prediction error on a movie. So it looks at movies and tries to minimize the prediction error of the upcoming frame in a movie. This would be a certain objective. Um, and then the diagnostic task could be, for instance, um, if it recognizes objects the same way as humans do. And then this would be a diagnostic task. And you have to kind of partly retrain the network or build an additional readout layer uh, on top of the network and train this um, on this specific diagnostic task. And the next step, um, we would maybe um, involve some kind of limited fit to human behavior. This is limited. We talk about the problems a little bit in the, in the paper. If you fit fully to human behavior, that involves some kind of problems with interpretation. Um, but yeah, this, uh, you might fit, for instance, um, some kind of uh, parameters which scale your reaction time distributions or your um, confidence uh, in the decisions of an object recognition task. Um, and finally, um, yeah, you evaluate whether um, your neural network actually performs the same. Um, on this diagnostic task as humans. And this kind of mimics in a similar way the structure um, has been done with cognitive process models here, like the initial part of the price and the structure. The model is often directly designed for the task structure, even though it's reusing kind of general components like attention or working memory. Um, and it's generally fit to human behavior. Um, and in the end, it's typically evaluated against human behavior and uh, you perform model selection. So this is not new. All right, um, Weiji. Yeah. Uh, so um, the thing that in the, in the evaluation, what you want to pay attention to is that you uh, look to machine learning for inspiration, but you don't, don't completely follow the uh, traditions in that field. Because if your purpose is to just make a well-performing machine, then the field just has to agree on a particular performance metric and then try to move along uh, across that metric. Um, but if the cognitive scientist's goal is to understand human behavior, uh, uh, that, that uh, human behavior cannot be simplified to a single scalar metric. And of course, as a cognitive scientist, we use a ho whole bunch of uh, measures uh, to summarize behavior and then to evaluate the similarity between models and behavior. Right? So uh, it's, it's, it's far beyond just accuracy. So in panel A, you see just accuracy on a uh, categorization task, a, categories A, B, C, D. But then uh, you can have a much more detailed representation where you look at the response distributions of a human and a DNN on the uh, four categories, A, B, C, D. And you can even do this as a, at a more refined level, at the, at the stimulus level. Um, now, in machine learning, there there's often uh, a lot of tension on adversarial attacks, which is that the DNN would misclassify category A as, as, as category C, and uh, th that's highlighting a particular failure. But it, it's important to realize that you can actually, um, and that's only one uh, small summary statistic of all, all the possible summary statistics that, that cognitive scientists uh, have been using to characterize what people do. Uh, illusions are sort of in the same, um, in, in the same vein. So an illusion would be that, um, uh, that a, a category is systematically misclassified. And there have been some papers that show, show that uh, DNNs uh, are uh, subject to the same illusions or to, or to different illusions than, than humans. So that in this case, um, that will be misclassifying A as B. Of course, um, 
uh, I've, I've also been happy to see that in, in recent years, there are more and more um, DNN papers that try to do um, rigorous cognitive psychology on uh, DNNs and that do continuous variations of stimulus parameters. As for example, you vary some noise parameter in an image and then look at accuracy of our proportion responses. So we get typical psychometric curves. And that's something that in machine learning might not be completely standard, but we want to use uh, methods that are um, a part of the cognitive scientist toolbox. Uh, ROC is a similar story. Uh, here's one that I also want to highlight. Uh, the plot is a little bit complicated, but uh, the idea is pretty much that if uh, you want to compare a human and a DNA in, term, in terms of um, their underlying processes, what you could do is you can fit a traditional cognitive process model to uh, their behavior. So you treat the DNN as if it's a human subject and you fit the same models that you would fit to a human subject. And so you, then you get, uh, you're using the process models as, as probes uh, into the uh, behavior of, um, of, of the human and the DNN. And if the human and DNN are, are, are more similar, are similar, then you would expect a strong correlation between the goodness of fit of the different process models, the simple models, um, between uh, f fitting to humans and fitting to DNNs. And so here's one paper that uh, Amin Orhan did with me where uh, he tested these four models that are uh, indicated, listed here as a function of um, the number of uh, training trials. So then, then we could co uh, compare this to um, the, the model um, ranking that we found, found in humans. So, uh, the third theme uh, that we try to address is uh, should cognitive science adopt more complex tasks and what kind of models are needed then and is there value in hybrids of cognitive process models and, and DNNs. So on the, on the point of more complex tasks, so uh, one thing that always strikes me uh, when people talk about comparing humans and, and DNNs is that there's this vast gulf in complexity, uh, this gap in complexity between the tasks that we use, right? So in Cognitive science, we uh, generally come from a reductionist tr tradition where we try to control as much as we can. We keep the stimuli low dimensional. So you end up with tasks such as the random dot motion task or um, Nathaniel Doss two-step tasks for studying planning. And those are fantastic. Those have taught us a lot about uh, cognitive mechanisms, but they're very, very different from the much more real world tasks uh, that uh, uh, are, uh, are used to train the NNs typically. Right? And perhaps this uh, discrepancy can be used as, as an inspiration for us cognitive scientists to also consider more complex tasks. Right? So there are certain uh, visual tasks that can still are still tractable experimentally and uh, th uh, computationally that are somewhere in between in, in, in terms of complexity between uh, like the very very simple ones and the ones that are in, in the real world. Right, and uh, maybe. Um, handwritten character uh, recognition or shape shape recognition or scene parsing those are uh, those are domains where that's possible in the in the domain of planning uh, there's a big space in between the two step task and a game like go and in our lab we've actually played around with this uh, uh, tic tac toe like game where you have to make four in a row on a four by nine board and uh, we've really been uh, happily surprised by how well it's possible to have good experimental and computational control over a task that is relatively complex uh, like that. So if I want to draw any kind of inspiration from the DNN literature, one of them would be to, uh, to, to move as cognitive science towards more uh, uh, complex, more ecologically valid tasks while still maintaining tractability. Adrian. Yeah, right. So yeah, I think this is an exciting um, actually perspective and uh, that we move more from cognitive science more to this intermediate complexity, because in the end, we want to probably explain human behavior in real world complexity. And I mean, going completely to the right end of that, that would be kind of infeasible and we wouldn't really learn a lot on along the way. Um, well, so how, like the problem is, of course, if you use intermediate complex tasks, also the model becomes, the, but the models become more complex. So we can kind of span this space here between a dimension of task complexity between low and high. 
um, and then the, the model complexity. Um, and this kind of uh, space uh, is kind of surrounded by areas where with one area would probably call overfitting and then some area where, for instance, uh, really high complexity tasks are probably intractable to fit with very low complexity models. Um, yeah, and classically, um, we have now, like, maybe it's very, it's, um, it's too dichot dichotomous, but we have these deep neural network models, which operate on very complex tasks and cognitive process models, which have very few number of parameters, maybe like one to 10, maybe maximally 20 parameters usually, which are fit. Um, and they kind of uh, are in this um, space kind of separate from each other. And um, so we kind of argue for um, that both kind of deep neural networks um, slash maybe machine learning or cognitive scientists that use deep neural, deep neural networks as models and cognitive um, scientists which use cognitive process models should maybe move to the same kind of intermediate space and use the same uh, tasks. And the idea is here that this could be in like First, it's kind of like an interesting challenge. So who's better on the same task? Um, so there's kind of a productive competition. Um, yeah, and then we have like for engineering or for deep neural networks, this might be interesting actually to work in the same space because then you can look at the cognitive process models and see oh, what, what kind of kind of concepts or inductive biases are they building in? So could I also maybe adopt this and then having the right inductive biases in the DNN actually leads to better generalization. So this might be interesting for engineering here as well. And for cognitive process models, as we um, said before, it's just generally interesting to see whether those mechanisms that have been studied, studied with these toy tasks actually generalize to the real world or like to more complex tasks. And I think for a lot of mechanisms that might not be the case, or it's at least an open question whether they scale to the same kind of complexity. Uh, of course, um, there's the problem, right? How do you do this with cognitive process models? They are actually sometimes already challenged with like small, small and not very complex tasks. And so there could be kind of an intermediate um, complexity model class, uh, which we call DNN enhanced cognitive process models, um, but they could also be called structured models or hybrid models. Um, and these models that combine the, the computational power of neural network as in their function as uh, general function approximators uh, with the structure of cognitive process models. And um, they probably have like a, a lot of like promise to explain these intermediate complexity tasks and um, where you can actually, again, work with your cognitive concepts and attach it to something like working memory or mental sim simulation or decision processes, but still work on these kind of more complex inputs. Um, and just to make this more clear what this is, um, so here are like uh, two very nice examples. One more structured one uh, from the uh, Josh Tenenbaum's group, um, which uh, uses video inputs of billiard balls um, and try to, tries to learn um, like the, the objects from this video um, by unsupervised learning and has this internal physics engine. And you see kind of, I don't want to go into these details, so um, please read the paper. Um, but you see that these building blocks are accessible to the typical questions that cognitive scientists ask. Um, while still being able to work on this quite complex input actually. And more generally, there's a lot of uh, work done on structured models, structured uh, unsupervised uh, latent models. So this is an example um, from Ryan Adams' group um, from a, where they have this latent switching line, linear dynamical system and it can basically learn, for instance, from data here to recognize different dynamics of mouse poses. So the video below are mouse, mice from seeing from above and recognizes different types of behaviors like running or like um, falling from the rear. And uh, so you impose some structure in the model whereas like the rest is learned. And um, these are probably very promising to uh, occupy this intermediate space. All right, so um, I think this was the last point with respect to um, this intermediate complexity models. And intermediate so what will happen models. now is, yeah, what will happen now is um, that we're gonna spend a, a couple of minutes uh, looking through the Q&A and uh, upvoting the questions and comments that are already there. They're, they're enough, so uh, you can just vote on the ones that are there or you can enter more. Uh, and um, the, the, some of these uh, were pre-submitted and we uh, put them in already at the beginning. I hope you can see those. Um, then in, we will select five to six comments on each theme, then allow you to comment on those comments. So hopefully that's the way to get uh, a discussion started. 
And then uh, if you're willing to speak up by voice, we're gonna ask uh, the people who ask the questions. Uh, play, please make sure to uh, not comment anonymously. Okay, so uh, the, uh, just as a reminder, uh, th theme one was, is it worth the effort to try to use DNA models for modeling behavior? Why, why not? Theme two, how to design and train DNNs in ways that are closer to humans. Uh, and theme three, uh, should cognitive science adopt more complex tasks? What kind of models are needed then? Is there value in hybrids of cognitive process models and DNNs? Why not? Um, and uh, if, you, if there's anything else that, that can go under theme four. Right, so we'll give you a couple of minutes now while we also look Wait. through the... Uh, Wait, here. apparently uh, no one can see the questions in the Q&A. Okay. Um, that is an unexpected technical problem. So uh, I'm going to stop share and then see if we can um, change that. Right, it should be a uh, change now. Can you raise your hand if you can see the uh, Q&A and vote, uh, vote up? Apparently it didn't work. All right, it's still not. Okay, so it, I have checked now all questions uh, attendees can upvote and comment. Okay, so I, I'm not exactly sure what else uh, we can do. Um, All right, uh, so something technically is going wrong. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry about that. I don't know uh, what it is. The, the settings uh, do look right to me now. Um, and uh, so instead what we're going to do is we are going to just um, uh, copy paste the ones that are already here. Okay, it, it looks like new questions are going to be Visible old ones are not. Okay, that is, that is a bit of an issue. Uh, sorry about that. So we're going to copy paste some of the older ones uh, now. We could repost the old ones. Yes. Um, I don't think that we can do that as, as um, no. hosts though. Sure. Um, Yeah, so I'm going to also post some of the older ones in the chat and then some, some attendee can actually propose them. And that's probably not a good idea because then we get multiple copies of it, yeah. Um, okay, how about we design one person to actually repost them. Okay, uh, Mingbo, uh, how about you, you can, can repost what I post in the, in the chat? Because as, an, as a host, I cannot post my own Q&A, so that's, it's a little bit funny. Uh, post into Q and A, Mingbo. From from the chat.
All right, I think we're up to date in terms of the uh, pre-posted questions. And uh, now I guess we're gonna um, put some of them in the presentation. Um, Benjamin, do you want to do maybe um, T1 and T2 and I do T3, T2 and T3? Yeah. Sorry, uh, T3 and T4, yeah. Okay, people are not specifying which theme they are commenting on, so we have to guess a little bit. So for theme one, um, I'm also say, I'm putting a new one here. All right, um, maybe a couple more, two more minutes and then we reconvene.
All right. So um, thank you so much for uh, for submitting questions and for voting on them. Uh, obviously, we don't have time to uh, address uh, everything, but I think we got the ones that uh, were upvoted. Um, so we'll start um, discussing those. And um, it's not that Benjamin and I are just going to answer those. So um, please, as we speak, you can uh, start commenting on the comments. So uh, shall we start with um, uh, theme one, Benjamin? Yeah. And maybe um, put the T1, C1 or the marker, like what is the comments towards in the chat as well or in the Q&A? Well, this is already referring to the Q&A, right? So some people can reply to this. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you want to walk us through T1? All right. Do you want to start the... Uh... Oh, yeah. I have to share screen first again. Eh? Yeah. All right. Done. Mm. All right. So I think we have three comments or questions. Uh, with respect to whether it's worth the effort. I mean, it's uh, anyways relative, like some people want to invest the effort or not, but if you have limited time and resource, otherwise we could actually model everything, try everything. So, okay, well, the first question, why not put effort into computational neural network models with the architecture and learning plus other constraints actually based on what we already know rather than brain implausible PNNs? And then there was a sub comment to this already, which was maybe the hope is that computationally simpler models can still use necessary expl explanatory property. Of course, we can go ahead and model everything, but we should stop somewhere. Uh, we can't go to the level of describing each electron in the brain. Okay, so um, wait, so people should just submit comments to this point. Yeah, in the if you have anything to say about it, you can say it too, but otherwise we'll just move on. Yeah, I think in general, uh, it kind of connects a bit to, um, uh, to, so first, I think the events are kind of powerful in the sense that they actually learn really well. And uh, if, the, if you build in the things you know, that's actually what people also do, right? You can imp implement your, the things we know about the brain architectures into neural networks. And there's a lot of work being done towards more biologically plausible DNNs. Um, the ones from machine learning are often like, developed for machine learning and they often don't really look like the brain so i think some partly it's being done um but yeah i think one reason why people actually use the off-the-shelf dnns are actually that they this this is really well optimized the training and uh the, the computations um and and the use of the gpu for past training uh, i think there's practical reason for that right now um yeah so from the point of view of behavior i'm a little bit skeptical that uh, in, uh, incorporating uh, biological constraints is going to help us that much in terms of selecting models that are good for behavior. Right? Because uh, there will still be a lot of degrees of freedom even with su such constraints. So they might not be uh, sufficient to really uh, narrow it down in a meaningful way. That being said, for, for other purposes, this might be a really good thing to do. Okay, so I just read the next comment or should we yeah, yeah, sure. I think I just read yeah. the question. Uh, so it's the intention really to limit the discussion to how to establish a research agenda for how they might be models of human behavior. DNNs can be very useful as tools for, to study human behavior without being models. For example, in many cases, the ideal observer is used to set a ceiling without necessarily being a model of the way the human solves the task. Very good point. Maybe that wasn't like optimal the way uh, I in, like, started the, uh, this, um, the presentation. Uh, this is actually some a point that we made in the paper, right? You want to say something about this? Yeah, maybe? so the idea is that uh, it's always very difficult to know what is the best any model can do on a particular data set. Right? The, the true limit is set by the irreducible variance or the entropy in the data, right? So no, data are noisy and some of that noise just cannot be explained. So uh, that, that's called the noise ceiling. And uh, it's very often a difficult problem how to estimate that noise ceiling. So a practical use of DNNs uh, something that Desfouli has uh, been using in certain recent preprints pre -print is to train a deep neural network as sort of an upper bound of what any neuro, neural, uh, any uh, cognitive model can uh, can achieve in terms of goodness of fit. Uh, 
Uh, it's a plausible upper, upper bound. It's not, not, not a hard proof. And now uh, we've tried that, uh, other people have tried it too. Generally, the deep neural network actually gets quite a bit better even when properly cross-validated than cognitive uh, process models. So uh, then uh, the next question is, how do you interpret that? Does that mean that you, as a cognitive modeler, you should try to fill that gap? Or is it something that we just have to live with uh, given how different, um, given the limitations of the cognitive process models? Right, so yeah, just to add to the point, if it's only about establishing, uh, establishing research agenda for how they might be good models of human behavior. So the, the point where this, the hybrid models they're, they're actually more used in their function of like universal function approximators. So then you could actually look at them and say, well, maybe they do something like the brain because they're all also neural and they have these connections, but um, they're, they're actually more used as a neural fun as function approximators. Um, okay, so some people say the DNN strained weights depend a lot on the initial random weights and are not that robust. Doesn't it disrupt interpretability? Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, yeah, that's that's definitely like a, an open question. What is the right level to compare models? Um, what is like, yeah, what is the, the essential thing about the model? And um, that's probably right that the weights are kind of like arbitrary in a way. And if you start interpreting initial weights, then you're missing probably the point a bit um, because they really depend on these kind of things. And then it's the question of what, at which level do you want to actually compare models? And I think one, Good suggestion is from uh, Nico Krieger's quarter, for instance, to use this representational similarity analysis where you compare at the representational space. Um, and then there's, for instance, work from Dave Susilo, um, which try to explain these models and compare the models at the level of like uh, dynamical systems and see how they behave. And if you can describe this in their behavior, how they transition from one fixed point to the other fixed point. And I think it's still an open field and like people don't know yet what is the right level, like the right level of um, simplifying the model, basically, uh, when you explain it and interpret it, that you still capture the essentials. Um, yeah, but I think this is not like a flaw in itself, it's just a challenge because um, it's still doing the, the task in some way. And um, that, that's the same with the human brain, where we don't know what individual neurons are doing and contributing to the task. Yeah. All right, T2. All right, T2, um, how to design and train the ends in a way closer to humans. So it's mentioned in the paper, um, it's mentioned in the paper, but individual differences may be tricky to deal with. In richer tasks, people would use diverse strategies with different goals, experiences, and engagement level. If individual differences can be explained by small changes in parameters, it is fine, but if subjects use vastly different strategies, R and ends may have to be tailored for individual subjects then how can we make general conclusions? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I, I think that this is uh, one of my biggest hangups on, on, on deep neural networks, right? In order to train them, uh, you pretty much have to uh, aggregate lots of data. And uh, un of course you can um, sort of circumvent that by having only limited data, to, uh, limited fitting to human data. So you do most of it through ecological pre-training like we're describing in the paper. Uh, but it's still uh, challenging to um, map individual variation to variation in, in uh, deep neural network uh, parameters, right? So often it's a many to one mapping. Uh, ideally, you would uh, reduce the effective dimensionality of the deep neural network. So you freeze part of it, for example, so that you can identify, let's say, a, a noise parameter and that noise parameter can be fit to an individual subject. And uh, that way you can account for some of the individual variability, but uh, that's an approach that's, that's not very traditional. And uh, some, some groups are trying to starting to do that, but um, there's definitely a long way to go there. Yeah, I mean, the, the same problem you're faced with in any, like if you want to describe the human behavior on the task or with a cognitive process model, if you use different strategies, yeah, it's, it's, like, it's a general problem and it's, it's indeed very interesting, but this is something that might emerge like in an optimal scenario. If you train a set of neural networks with different, maybe slightly different variations in architecture and pre-training, then you might actually see that they actually use different strategies. And of course, then it's a problem. How do you describe this and how do you quantify whether they use different strategies or just a parametric difference? Um, but this might be very interesting because you might actually find that you find also two different strategies 
good human subjects. Um, yeah. So and, uh, absolutely. Uh, so um, I, I, I like in a cognitive process model, you would fit the parameters on your video subject uh, basis. That's that's the gold standard, right? And then uh, because you have let's say maybe three or four parameters, it's manageable. Uh, it's identified. The parameters are ident identifiable and interpretable. And in a DNN, you really have to narrow down your parameter space, uh, the, the part of the parameter space that you're using to account for individual differences, because otherwise um, there seem to be just way too many degrees of freedom. Yeah. Right, so um, maybe we should continue. Um, yeah. So one thing that I really like about probabilistic models is that they have an implicit notion uncertainty, which seems to be implicit to human cognition and perception too. Do DNNs have a similar notion? So yeah, so they do. Uh, they do. So uh, actually, in, a, in that same paper with Emin Orhan that I described earlier, he shows that uh, when you train a deep neural network on the task, then it develops representations that, um, when uh, when interrogated, be, uh, behave like uh, Bayesian probabilistic representations. And so uncertainty is implicitly there, and it can be decoded. And the system as a whole behaves like a Bayesian decision maker, even though that was not built in. So um, that, um, that, that is actually quite easy to obtain. It was easier than we thought it was. Um, uh, and the, the real question is how far is that going to scale? Because and the, the, uh, the, the, the types of tasks where uh, uncertainty can be really well quantified are typically really, really simple tasks. Um, can can we scale this up to more complex tasks? And I think in general, there's a lot of um, models which ex have explicit notions of uncertainty, like variation autoencoders, um, Bayesian neural networks. So I think there is some way to explicitly even do, like, incorporate this. Um, yeah. Uh, it would be helpful to discuss in more concrete terms how DNN might be used to answer questions of this high dimensional behavior that were previously out of reach. For example, we can now develop ideal observer models of complex behavior without an a priori theory of the, how the problem is solved as it requires of a, of a cognitive process model. Yeah. Yeah, um, Benjamin, do you have anything to say about this? Um, yeah, so I think this is actually, it's a very good point, I think, because uh, if you come as a cognitive scientist, um, and say like, well, I have these concepts, this historically like rich uh, literature and a body of knowledge on cognitive concepts. So now I, uh, what is like memory decisions and so on. Uh, and now I've fit a DNN and just does it. And like, how does it relate to all these things? Um, so yeah, so I guess one maybe uh, potential intermediate step is the thing we talked about hybrid and structured models, where you still kind of like have a structure of how you think the model might uh, solve the task, or humans might solve the task using these concepts, uh, and then use the, the function approximators, the neural networks as function approximators, to um, like make this scale this model up, basically. Um, and yeah, we we cite a few of these um, promising approaches, and I think this would be a good intermediate way to go, where you still have this kind of um, idea of how the task might be solved, and uh, still are able to work on these more complex simulation tasks. Okay, so maybe this is a good um, moment to see if anybody who submitted any of these questions uh, uh, would like to um, respond or elaborate. So please raise your hand if you were one of the people who asked uh, one of these questions and uh, wanted to uh, say more. Okay, I, I don't see any hands right now, but uh, we'll keep looking. Um, then uh, T4, in terms of Mars' tri-level scheme of understanding, where would you put DNNs in terms of a tool to understand human behavior? And what about the cognitive process models that you referred to in the paper? Yeah, so yeah. DNNs uh, aspire to be in implementational level, right? and that's, that's, their, that's their great strength. And what we are trying to do here is to see if they are, uh, can be, good algorithmic models and maybe even computational level models. I would say that the process models live at those upper two levels, at the computational and the algorithmic um, level. Uh, the, the goal of the computation and 
sort of the recipe by which it's solved in sort of interpretable um, stages. Um, I think it's a very interesting question of whether we are comparing apples and oranges, right? In spite of writing this paper with Benjamin and learning a lot from him, I still uh, have some of that skepticism, right? Like uh, if we were to compare DNA models with cognitive models, process models, then I think our, our, our default is that we are comparing apples and oranges and maybe by doing some of the things that, that we're describing in the paper and that other people have done, uh, we can make the apples more orange-like but uh, it's going to be a, a real challenge to bring them at the same level of, um, of, um, of the of Mars scheme. Benjamin? Yeah, so, yeah, I think, um, the, I think the, the key point here is the, the, what is under the experimental control or the control of the researcher. And I think the, the computational algorithmic level is like naturally at the control of the experiment, like the researcher at cognitive process models. And it's a le bit more elusive in uh, DNNs. Uh, but still, you can ask these questions um, and analyze them and build your own kind of algorithmic implementation of a certain computational goal into this DNNs. And um, just I wanted to refer to a very recent paper um, by Jessica Hamrick and Shakir Mohammed, both from DeepMind. They actually, this is uh, called Levels of Analysis for Machine Learning. Um, I think it's very interesting and insightful. They try to relate these three con uh, levels of MAR um, to the question, how, like, what, how does it relate to DNNs? Um, so I think I would refer to this paper, um, which is, yeah, it's great. Okay. Uh, I deleted the remaining one because it was just a repeat of the earlier one. Um, I'm having a quick look if there's something else that has been heavily upvoted. Um, it doesn't look like it, but uh, we can now have the, an open discussion. So is there anything that we... Uh, it's discussed or is any of these comments something that you would like to comment on and now you can either put it in the Q&A or in the or in the chat And uh, I'm also going to monitor if, if people have raised their hands. So if you would just like to speak, um, please raise your hand and you can tell us what you think. Um, one thing that uh, I'd personally be interested in is whether uh, uh, reading or discussing this paper uh, has made you more willing to give the deep neural networks a try in uh, for, for the purpose of modeling behavior. Or maybe less willing, that, that's or less interested, that's also okay. So there is a, a question in the Q&A um, that um, by Anthony Chen. Benjamin, I'm also typing it, it to you in the chat. Um, is the task of designing AI to work like humans, the question of general intelligence and one of the ultimate goals of AI? Um, could one solution be simply be uh, to design better AI in more and more complex environments, ones in which humans are inherently good at, and the two types of intelligence should converge to similar solutions? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of work in this, uh, in this um, general direction. And uh, like one, one group, uh, type of work that I really like is see, looking at um, human learning as an inspiration for uh, machine learning. So uh, my colleague Brendan Lake at NYU is uh, doing a lot of that. Um, so learning from very few examples, like what, what, what people can do. Um, but I feel that the general tendency in um, the like front 
a frontline machine learning community is not to care that much about human behavior. Right? So if uh, an, uh, an artificial system outperforms humans on a particular task, then human behavior pretty much becomes irrelevant to them. And one of the points that we're trying to make in the, in the paper, I'm caricaturing a little bit, but uh, uh, one of the points I'm trying to make in the paper, we are trying to make in the paper is that if you're really serious about understanding human behavior, then you have to dig deeper at that point. You have to just not try to improve your machines any further, but you have to see, uh, are we characterizing behavior in sufficient detail? Uh, uh, what aspects of that behavior is the AI still missing? Uh, how can we systematically go about uh, increasing the similarity? Yeah, I guess it's partly different and partly the same, right? So um, it's an, actually the same in the sense of general intelligence. And we, when we say we, what we say gen generalization is, is kind of human defined, right? We define this network actually should generalize to this other situation because I, as a human, can generalize to this situation. Then it's kind of partly aligned. But yeah, as Weiji said, like if it's about the details of how things are implemented, for instance, um, uh, is approximate inference used or like what are the solutions that are being used, then uh, it's much more detailed uh, um, and that might actually go different routes um, in machine learning and uh, cognitive science. There's a question from Sadi Sadegi in the Q&A. How are DNNs more useful in modeling human behavior than other ML algorithms? So my answer to that would be, they are not necessarily more, more useful. So uh, there's a long tradition in computational cognitive science and computational neuroscience to uh, draw inspiration from ML algorithms, whether it's uh, sampling or uh, variational approximations or clustering algorithms. And in, in many cases, they have given rise to very good uh, algorithms to describe human behavior. So uh, I, I wouldn't say that their DNNs are generally more useful, I think, we're asking the question whether they can potentially reach a similar yet level of usefulness. I mean, you could argue that um, DNNs might actually be slightly better if you kind of say, well, structure constraints algorithmic uh, algorithms, for instance. So what kind of algorithms can emerge? And then the algorithms finally uh, determine the behavior in certain conditions. So, uh, and you can, in DNN, there's kind of, you can implement this idea of layers and you can implement the idea of recurrence. And for instance, that the brain has to kind of anticipate the input. So it kind of predict it into the future slightly because the um, input is lagged and kind of delayed. So um, you kind of can rebuild this a bit, a little bit. And then you have the small units, which look a bit like neurons, but probably are not a good model of that. But at least in a kind of, maybe hand wavy, maybe more, maybe more rigorous way that's also possible. They, the structure might constrain algorithms to emerge that are more similar to the algorithms that we have in our brain. Yeah. So I think this is the hope basically. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, um, maybe this is time to wrap up. It's almost 1.45. Um, thank you very much for uh, sticking uh, with us until the end. I hope you uh, this was useful to some extent. Um, I hope somebody is still listening uh, at this point. Um, uh, if you have more comments on the paper, uh, references that we missed, uh, don't hesitate to email us. Uh, and thank you very much for coming. Take care. Yeah, also thank you from my side.